Okay, so thank you so much to Ken and Selena for coming tonight from the Endangered Ecosystems Alliance. So um, for over 30 years, Ken has been working to protect nature in Canada. Today, he's one of the country's most experienced working conservationists and currently serves as the executive director and founder of the Endangered Ecosystems Alliance, a national organization working to advance the science-based protection of Canada's most endangered ecosystems. And many of you may know Ken from um, his former role as the executive director of the Ancient Forest Alliance and of the uh, Wilderness Committee's Victoria chapter. And before that, he ran various other conservation groups. And Selena is the Outreach and Operations Director working um, also with the Endangered Ecosystems Alliance. And, uh, and a big thank you to both of you for coming today. And, uh, and um, we can we can sh start sharing your screen, and I'll pass it over to you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So grateful. And Selena and I will be giving a joint presentation. So Selena, I'll, I'm going to stop sharing part way, and then Selena will, will go, and then I'll go back to to finish it off. Um, so I'm grateful, by the way, for the Victoria Natural History Society. The, the organization actually really launched my previous organization, Ancient Forest Alliance. When I, uh, me and my colleague TJ were getting that up and running, it was um, uh, Claudia and uh, Darren Copley who had hosted a bunch of slideshows that essentially put a foundation under uh, of our first supporters uh, under Ancient Forest Alliance in, in like that was like 12 years ago now. Um, and uh, yeah, and now the, I, I've uh, moved to Quebec. I'm actually in BC right now, just for some field trips and for uh, some key fundraising events, but normally I'm in Quebec. So I've um, worked with Selena here to set up the Endangered Ecosystems Alliance. It's a new organization that uh, is working to protect the most endangered ecosystems, working to bring in messages around health and economy, along with the core biodiversity and climate messages. And that is focused on non-traditional allies and supporting Indigenous protected areas with critical financing. There's a whole bunch of uh, niche area that you'll uh, will explain more on how I believe it's these are important uh, components. They're really game changers if we're going to protect the diversity of native ecosystems. So I'm going to give uh, a slideshow that's a bit of a hybrid. It's going to start off with the amazing ecosystems across the country. Just a smattering. We can't do everything, but I will sh I'll show you so some awesome images and the framework for that. And then we'll get into the old growth issue. I know a lot of people. Are focused on that. That is my passion as well over, over several decades, and we're getting to the crux on that. So I'll explain a lot of, I think a lot of key um, detail that I think very few uh, people so far in the conservation movement um, are tuned into uh, and are aware. And Selena will talk about some key aspects of the new uh, approach and messaging, and then, um, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. So to try to do this here all within 30 to 40 minutes here. <laughs> and I'm going to go fairly quick, right? Because I don't, I know nobody wants to be on Zoom too long. Um, so let's get started here. Um, share screen here. And uh, one second here, slideshow, uh, play from start. Okay, is that on? Is that all good? Okay. Looks good. Um, excellent. Right, so uh, people will typically know me as the old growth temperate rainforest um, activist from Victoria. <laughs> That's where I spent the most time, 20 years. I've got a, uh, I'm in Quebec. I've got a cute little daughter in Quebec. So <laughs> that's where I'm mainly located. And I've always loved the diversity of ecosystems around the country. Um, even though uh, I, I've spent most of my time working to protect old growth forests, the tremendous diversity of ecosystems in Canada uh, moves my passion, including treeless landscapes with no trees in southern grasslands and in other. Uh, and the, the reason why I love Victoria Natural History Society people, because you're my kind of people, you have the biophilia like to focus on things like shipworms and moss and uh, the whole presentations on shipworm shipworms. Um, so it's it's the diversity of life and the diversity of ecosystems that moves me. Temperate rainforests are certainly a charismatic one. I'm, I'm, we're getting close to finishing a lot of the key work to, I think, protect, protect most of it. Um, but it's the diversity of life and ecosystems that moves me. So um, uh, there's a niche here. People, people think, well, oh, just another national environmental group. What's the point? There is a point. <laughs> there are certain uh, 
niches and emphases that need to be bolstered and, and filled more uh, readily. Um, there's a lot of con national conservation groups. The, there's greater opportunities in different parts of the country to uh, protect areas less contested by industry. Our focus are on the most contested ecosystems with um, in generally in the south and the most endangered ecosystems. So these are the areas, for example, that with the least rep that are least represented in the protected area system, typically because industry wants them the most. Um, and there's very little remaining in, in many cases under the greatest threat by industrial development, the least remaining geographic extent relative to their original extent because the history of settlement and colonialism and indus industry. Some of these are naturally rare to begin with, limited geographic extent in general. Um, and we'll, we'll go over a few of these and um, are, are typically the places with the greatest concentrations of species at risk. And so if you look at that, where that is, um, the species at risk richness, it's in the southern part of the country where the vast majority of people live because of the warmest climate, the richest soil, um, which is best for farming, uh, that grew the biggest trees for logging, um, where the massive concentration of people are, right? So these are the southern ecosystems. There's a need to protect across the diversity of ecosystems. Our focus is gonna be, uh, is in the areas that are most contested. Um, and so if you look at the ecosystem types across the country, the vast majority of Canada really is um, Arctic, uh, taiga, subarctic, uh, boreal and a lot of um, sort of uh, muskeg landscapes. Those are all native ecosystems that, where the vast majority of people live are in the Southern sliver of ecosystems, really in Southern Ontario, as well as the Fraser Valley, Southern Vancouver Island, um, you know, the St. Lawrence Valley, uh, but it's those Southern ecosystems that are the areas most heavily hit where the species richness is and which are typically the least protected. Where the protected areas are happening as a whole are in the far north. And thank God it's it's happening there, but there's gotta be a greater emphasis on the south in the endangered ecosystems. The federal government is moving forward on a lot of protected areas. As a whole, their policies have largely been the, uh, they're sort of like the non-endangered ecosystems alliance. <laughs> they're protecting the areas with the least contested landscapes. And those areas need to be protected. You never know what the future brings in terms of risks and threats, but we've gotta move south. Um, so most of the large and the new protected areas are in the far north, in those Arctic, subarctic, far, far northern boreal um, landscapes, muskeg landscapes in the far north. Um, if you look at Quebec, for example, where I live these days, um, this is the most advanced province that has adopted. They're competing with Canada, which is great for protected areas. Um, they've adopted uh, um, the, the national targets. They've even exceeded them in terms of an interim 2022 target. Um, most of the protected areas you, you can see are in the um, in the Arctic, uh, in the forested tundra, taiga, um, the boreal, and there's very little down in the hardwood forest, for example, the deciduous forests of the south, where the vast majority of endangered species are, where people are, forest clearing for agriculture and cities, Montreal, <laughs> um, British Columbia. Um, if you look at the top seven most pr protected biogeoclimatic zones, ecosystem types, six of the seven are concentrate, they're alpine and subalpine ecosystems. Um, with one exception, the coastal Western hemlock, the temperate rainforest, that is a hard fought ecosystem, right? Where that has stirred the passion of, of um, millions of British Columbians and, and people around the world, in fact. Germany, I think, love species hold growth as much as British Columbians do it, it seems. Um, but the, these, uh, um, but that, that's the exception because of the most monumental conservation battles in North American history. The rest is largely um, alpine, subalpine. And thank God as well, we need to save those ecosystems, but we got to get it down in elevation as well, expand a lot more protected areas in, in the uh, low, lowland ecosystems and in the south in, in Canada. So this means that we need ecosystem-based targets. Every ecosystem types needs to have uh, uh, targets as opposed to just land without recognition of the, those targets. We need uh, more ambitious uh, targets. The province um, hasn't even adopted the, the basic federal targets, which is adopted by about 70 nation states around the world, the so-called high ambition coalition of, of countries, diverse countries, um, calling for 30% protection of their land areas by 2030. 
And Trudeau is also put in 25% by 2025. Quebec is 22% uh, by 2022 as well. But British Columbia is still um, stuck uh, on the old targets, uh, which is um, 17%. I don't even know if they even endorsed the 17%. It was supposed to be 17% by, by uh, 2020. And that hasn't uh, happened. British Columbia is down at about 15%. So we need more ambitious targets. The science says we need to keep about 50% of Earth in um, protected areas or what they call climate stabilization areas, de facto protected areas, 50% in nature by 2030. Um, so even the 30% by 2030 is too low. Um, so we need to get the provinces to support the federal targets at the bare minimum. Um, and we need to get federal and provincial funding. The feds are moving pretty heavily on this, though, for, to their credit, um, especially to protect the indigenous champions of protected areas. That's how the expansion of protected areas is uh, happening all across the country. It's First Nations protected areas initiatives. Um, that is, is how you actually protect land. And there needs to be funding to, and I'll explain why. Um, and also for private lands, the only way to actually protect private lands is to buy them. Um, or you can have conservation covenants, that's true, but the most stringent um, measures are, are protected areas and you need funding for that as well. So those are just the overview of the policy goals of the national um, organization that we're running. Um, I'm just gonna go from, okay, I'm gonna go from west to uh, east, leaving out the temperate rainforest uh, in coastal British Columbia uh, and, and inland uh, rainforest, because we're gonna go more heavily into that. I'm gonna go fairly quickly on uh, to just show you the amazing ecosystems across the country, <laughs> some of these places that, that um, make me excited. Um, so, and you're, you're gonna be familiar with a whole bunch of these ones. And I guess many people here have lived across the country, explored different parts of the country. Um, to me, just moving from BC to Quebec and going back through a diversity of ecosystems totally got me revved up to set up this new organization with Selena. Starting from the west here, the, in the coastal Douglas fir zone, uh, there's an arbutus, pretty amazing trees. Um, they've got one of the highest concentrations of endangered species in the country. And of course, I'm sure you guys are all uh, the experts in Gary Oak ecosystems and Camas Meadows. Uplands Park is one of the rare areas with the deep, rich soils. Um, as opposed to on the rocky outcrops where you often find Gary Oaks, there are some areas, and these are largely indigenous people who have, uh, uh, who have on these really rich sites who really help to foster those lush sea level wildflower meadows with camas and, and Gary Oak. Um, the, uh, and sharp-tailed snakes, I'm, I'm sure you guys have done whole presentations on sharp-tailed snakes. <laughs> it's a, one of the endangered species in, this, uh, in the Gary Oak ecosystems. Um, one of my big ecosystem fetishes, <laughs> it's ancient, big mossy and fern covered big leaf maples. Th these, there's just a few sites. I got excited by these actually first in the Olympic National Park and then started exploring um, different valleys on Southern Vancouver Island to see if there were a few old growth remnants like that on the South Island. And in just a few little spots, we found these 300 year old giants that can be 10 feet wide at the base, um, covered from top to bottom uh, by, by uh, mosses and ferns, um, the most epiphyte covered trees in the entirety of North America. There's even um, roots apparently that grow from the branches of big leaf maples to tap into the soil that develops under those moss mats. What a crazy tree, it's got roots in the canopies to get soil that builds up under the moss. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and some uh, from, again, top to bottom, uh, once you move towards the western side of Vancouver Island, um, where you get big leaf maple, even though it's a little more common in the, in the rain shadow, um, as you move into the rainforest where you get the pockets of the old growth, they're, they're so luxuriant and spectacular. Um, looks like a, uh, what is that? Like a big ma um, mermaid moss or giant, giant, what would they, Sasquatch sperm, or I don't know, <laughs> it's a, uh, this um, giant moss fell off the uh, branch of a, a mossy maple there. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's pretty fun to come across these in around this time of year after the winter storms. Oh, here's a cool place. Okay, in the Fraser Valley, in the islands of the Fraser Valley, you got some of the biggest deciduous trees in the entirety of North America. 10 foot wide black cottonwoods. Some have been found 13 feet wide on the islands of the Fraser. They would have also lined 
the um, in, throughout the Fraser Valley, but they would have lined the Fraser uh, itself along the shores. But most of those have been cleared for agriculture uh, and the cities are on top of a lot of this as well, the lower mainland. But there are a few islands uh, that, and the little pockets that we're, we're gonna be highlighting soon that we've had a chance to explore that are just so spectacular. Like that is, you think looking at that, that that's a Douglas fir or something, a giant conifer, that's a giant deciduous tree. And there are um, hundreds of these giant cottonwoods in just a few locations left. Scott Paper and Mac Blow annihilated the vast majority of these stands in the 1980s and early 1990s um, to create hybrid poplar plantations in rows on the Fraser Valley back in the 90s. An ecological travesty that largely went uncontested at the time. Um, a lot of these areas in the cottonwood ecosystems, um, this one is near the Sumas area, I noticed, uh, are all still being subdivided for the sprawling uh, suburbs of the lower mainland. You can see the, uh, the houses and new suburbs you know, pushing against the, some of the remnants here. Um, moving to the BC interior, and my apologies again, I'm not covering all the ecosystems, just a few of the more charismatic ones, and there's others that, that I could highlight, but I'm going to move fairly quick. Um, the bunch grass ecosystems, uh, the biogeoclimatic zone in the South Okanagan, Thompson, Fraser, Nicola Valleys. We've got a whole kind of intermountain interior grasslands and shrublands. Um, in the, this is Spotted Lake, um, important for the uh, people of the uh, Okan South Okanagan. Um, I don't know how that happens, by the way. If you, I'm sure one of your people have uh, done a presentation on why Spotted Lake has these salt mineral cells that it forms at certain times of year. Um, this area will be part, likely, of the uh, South Okanagan Similkameen National Park Reserve, which currently the local First Nations are negotiating with the federal government and the province. Um, antelope brush, uh, the, the, the hottest, driest parts of the South Okanagan, uh, where you get antelope brushes, what they typically call the pocket desert. Even though it's not quite a desert, it's not quite um, uh, dry enough, it, uh, it's pretty close, the closest we have, and it's a hot, amazing uh, ecosystem. Uh, they're with native burrowing owls, they're trying to reintroduce them. Um, apparently it's not going so well. I think it's because if you don't um, change the conditions that led to the species demise, and then you try to restore the species, then probably the same thing's gonna happen, right? So the goal is to uh, protect and restore more of the habitat. Um, badgers in the BC interior. I ha heard a population guesstimate, there's only 50 badgers estimated to live in BC's interior. Um, the greatest diversity of bats are found in the South Okanagan. Ponderosa pine, old growth ponderosa pine, my favorite tree, the most fragrant tree. Apparently it has a vanillin in the bark, which is, uh, same you know compound in vanilla plants so it's a delicious smelling bark you want to take a giant bite out of the side <laughs> um, pretty amazing the very little old growth ponderosa, uh, ponderosa pine is protected in the protected area system moving to Alberta where I grew up I grew up a lot in uh, southern Alberta and Saskatchewan um, and the southern foothills uh, are some of the most spectacular landscapes these are the places where thousands of elk come down from the Rockies into the grasslands in the fall. And you also have grassland wolves and grizzlies mixed with the ground squirrels and the badgers. Like it's a spectacular landscape. One of the few areas from sort of the front ranges and the grasslands of Waterton up north towards the uh, Porcupine Hills region um, that, that uh, there's been luckily some important conservation efforts to expand protected areas in recent years in the foothills, grasslands and parkland uh, and montane ecosystems. But open pit coal mining is uh, a big risk in the area. There was a, a plan by the Kenny government to open up a huge areas of the Rockies for uh, open pit coal mining. And the conservation groups there, fantastic. The greatest um, conservation movement, I think, in recent history, because the environmentalists rounded up um, ranchers, uh, hunters and anglers, country music singers, um, local town councils, um, farmers worried about water, uh, and they um, built a movement that was able in southern Alberta, which people believe is a place where environmentalists are unable to exert influence, to kill the, those proposals. 
Um, doesn't mean that they won't res resurrect their ugly head and there's other sneaky ways to move ahead with that. But the Old Man River was at risk and the ranchers and the farmers, as well as the fly fishers and the, and the hunting community um, and country music singers with environmentalists spearheading um, a lot of the key information stream. Uh, my particular friends in CEPA, Southern Alberta, built a hell of a movement, something to learn from. We need to get outside our base, which um, Selena is going to talk about. Um, I love the grasslands of Southern Saskatchewan and Alberta and, and Manitoba. This is uh, actually the east block of Grasslands National Park, where they've reintroduced, uh, actually in the west block, 300 bison, um, as well as uh, black-footed ferrets. The swift fox is back there. Um, it's one of the last places, the only place in the country, actually, now, with black-tailed prairie dog colonies. You can spend all day watching them. They're very animated. And I think sea lions and... Prairie dogs are the two funnest groups of organisms to watch. They're very animated and dynamic. Um, pronghorn, which um, it's a weird creature. Uh, this is, they're not actually antelope. Uh, they're called, people used to call them pronghorn antelope, but they're most closely related to okapi. It's a type of, um, you know, ungulate in Africa and giraffes. Uh, and so it's a pretty crazy creature. You see them all over the, the southern grasslands. Um, different kinds of badlands in southern Alberta. The sandstone badlands along the Milk River are the most spectacular. I love them. Pretty amazing place. Um, Great Sand, I'm sorry, I'm going quick. I just realized I'm talking too much. Uh, the Great Sand Hills in southern Saskatchewan. You go through all these um, agriculturalized landscapes uh, for, for the longest stretch, like in thousand kilometers, but somehow you come across this stretch that all of a sudden, um, becomes native vegetation over 2000 square kilometers in Southern Saskatchewan in the Great Sand Hills of vegetated and, um, and shifting sand dune complexes and more deer than you'll ever see anywhere in the country on an evening drive with the exception of uh, Oak Bay and Gordon Head. <laughs> um, but it's a pretty amazing place. Um, uh, it's hard to believe this is a, uh, uh, it's a great Southern wilderness area in uh, Blackfeet, Siksika territory. Um, here and now, uh, the huge area of of um, a lot of the prairies that has been one of the most heavily hit is the aspen parkland, sort of a transition between the prairie grasslands into the boreal forest farther north. With the gr more um, uh, precipitation, you've had huge agricultural conversion of these ecosystems. They're actually a lot scarcer. Than, the, than a lot of the drier prairie grasslands. They call it Canada's duck factory. It's where you get those um, wetlands everywhere and little aspen groves. Um, there's a huge need to protect those areas. Um, and then a tiny sliver, it's sort of like the Gary Oak ecosystem, the level of endangerment. In Manitoba, you get tall grass prairie, like literally like 1.5%, 2% remains, the teeniest fraction. And when you go there, you sort of realize why. If you were like an early settler, You've got the richest, deepest black soil that ever existed anywhere. Um, and this is, uh, um, you know, it's like the perfect place you can basically farm. And there's almost none of it left, except in a few patches. They, they, they don't, haven't picked up all the patches I've noticed. That, that's got to be a priority is to get the last of the tall grass prairie near. Um, it's the, they've discovered a, sort of a region that has a whole bunch of these last remnants in more recent decades. Um, and then the in southern Ontario, the Carolinian forest. This is Bacchus Woods. It's uh, one of the most amazing places I've been to. Uh, there's actually Selena's right there, and with Tanya. And this is the um, an old growth deciduous forest uh, in the uh, just north of Long Point uh, in southern Ontario. And most of Canada essentially lives on top of the Carolinian. Toronto's there, Hamilton's there, London's there, Guelph and Windsor. Uh, actually, not Guelph, but Windsor's on top of it, Sarnia. And we've lost the vast majority of the Carolinian ecosystems as well. Um, and hats off to several First Nations on their own reserves have de declared indigenous uh, protected areas. Uh, some of the biggest tracts of recent protected areas are on the First Nations reserves in um, recently uh, protected in, in southern Ontario. Okay, so those, that's a diversity of ecosystems, but we're going to go circle back to the West Coast here. This is what people... Um, are largely focused on, okay, and, and there's an important, um, uh, Im important update I wanted to sort of give on, on some key angles on where the old growth 
temperate rainforest and the old growth in, across ecosystems issue issue is in British Columbia. Uh, oh, here's a here's a picture, by the way. That's the picture that first captured my imagination about old growth forests. When I was 10 years old, my dad found in some 99 cent book bin the Illustrated Natural History Canada of Canada series. And he brought the Pacific Coast um, book to me. In it, I saw this picture and I thought, that's crazy. How could a tree possibly be so big that people could dance on the stump? Do they exist anymore? Turns out they do. As once I came out to UBC to do uh, do work, uh, go to uh, study ecology when I was 17, I started to explore a lot of the old growth temperate rainforests um, and realized that we still have some remnants. This is the Red Creek fir, largest Douglas fir tree in the country. It's got a hemlock root going down the side, like a giant anaconda. Uh, a lot of you probably seen this tree. San Juan spruce, also near Port Renfrew in Pachidat First Nations territory. It's uh, was the biggest um, sick of spruce in the country until the top broke off in a storm a few years ago. Um, these are such huge trees. It's like they have their own gravity. <laughs> you feel their gravitational pull. They're so like arriving at a small moon. <laughs> uh, they're pretty amazing. This is the um, Big Lonely Doug. So I named Big Lonely Doug um, this name, which seemed to go viral, um, but because uh, it's a Douglas fir, it, it's, it was completely surrounded by a clear cut. It was lonely. And turns out it was the second largest Douglas fir. When we went down with uh, Andy McKinnon and measured it um, just the, after we first came across this tree, uh, turns out it was the second biggest known. And since then, it's been sort of the best environmental education um, center in the country that contrasts the grandeur of old growth forests with their destruction. Um, this is the Chiwat Giant, the largest tree in terms of timber volume in the entire country in Pacific Rim National Park uh, Reserve. So this is, uh, it's 450 cubic meters, 450 telephone poles worth of wood. Uh, the Gorgon Giant, um, this is a huge, uh, huge red cedar, luckily within the um, a house it uh, First Nations land use vision, an area that uh, is uh, on Flores Island in Clackwood Sounds uh, is going to be protected through the First Nations old growth protection initiatives. Um, this is one of the crazy burliest bulbous trees we found with a little cave inside where my friend lives. <laughs> no, just kidding. But this is a, uh, again, one of those crazy shapes that you see um, uh, in, the, in the coastal rainforest, complex structures. And this is on the way to the Chiwat Giant near Chiwat Lake, luckily within Pacific Rim National Park. Um, these, some of this stuff is, I think uh, this audience is fairly ed educated on this, so I'm not going to dwell too long. Um, most of the temperate rainforest uh, has been, old growth temperate rainforest has been logged, southwestern mainland and Vancouver Island. Uh, most of it used to be moderate to high productivity old growth forest. Low productivity are the bogs and subalpine landscapes, um, and the vast majority has been logged. Today now, this is a bit old, this map, but it's about 81% of the moderate to high productivity old growth has been logged, mainly it's second growth in yellow and some urban and agricultural as well. Um, of the actual high productivity ecosystems, we're looking at about eight to 9% on Vancouver Island. Um, so that's the areas with the most classic forest giants. A lot of the, the hurdle we've had to overcome is over time, um, the, a lot of the old growth is on uh, in subalpine areas, areas lacking soil in the coastal bog landscapes. These uh, old growth um, shore pines, can be 300 years old, the technically old growth, but not, not at risk by logging. And there's a lot of that, by the way. The whole outer coast of the Great Bear Rainforest and of northwestern Vancouver Island, is uh, most of it is boggy uh, landscapes. Native ecosystems, they deserve protection. But in terms of dealing with the actual risks to the ecosystems right now, um, it's got to be the, the productive old growth forest, moderate to high productivity old growth forests. The government's um, PR and strategy for the longest time has been to save the small trees uh, and to log the big trees. But the claim there's a lot of old growth forests by mixing in all these forest types um, with these, it's just in a giant mix. <laughs> and the, the distinction in productivity is vital um, to get a clear view of what's really going on. Um, and uh, an, an obstacle or hurdle, I think we've uh, in at least in a lot of the circles have overcome is this whole idea that if you log old growth forests and replant the trees, then what's the issue? 
And, you know, this, this, uh, you guys will know this, that you can't um, have a 50 to 60 year rotation um, and expect that the same characteristics of the old growth that stands that are 200 or 300 or 2000 years old in some cases will be replicated. So they, they have different characteristics. Second growth stands never become old growth again um, under BC's short rotation system of 50 to 60 years. They lack the uh, well-developed understories, the multi-layered canopies, um, the woody debris and standing and fallen dead trees. Um, some of the biggest uh, conks I've ever seen uh, in the mossy maple grove here. Um, so the deadwood is vitally important. And as well, because of their unique characteristics, they're home to unique species. There used to be about uh, 2,000 spotted owls in British Columbia by 1990. There were about 200. By the year 2000, there were three dozen. And the last I saw, there's three left in the wild, in the wilds of BC, and about um, a dozen in captivity that they're trying to breed. That's because of old growth logging on the southwestern mainland. Uh, mountain caribou, the southern interior mountain caribou, which winter in the old growth um, forests, uh, they're down to about a thousand when there used to be tens of thousands. And marbled murelet seabirds, which nest in the old growth canopy, um, they're on southern and eastern Vancouver Island. The populations have, have diminished over the years. Um, old growth forests also supply the uh, uh, clean water for uh, wild salmon and also for the people, the drinking water of uh, the people of Victoria and uh, Vancouver and uh, Tofino and uh, communities across British Columbia. Um, and of course, these are the unceded territories of a large diversity of First Nations who never legally gave up their land. This is still their territories. This is an important point we're going to come back to. And many of their cultures evolved in old growth forests using um, you know, cedar for their bark, for uh, old growth cedars for, for uh, dugout canoes, totem poles, uh, masks, uh, all, all manner of different items. There's been a lot of emphasis in recent years on carbon capture and sequestration devices. Um, to counteract the climate crisis, but they're starting to realize that the best carbon capture and sequestration device around is called a tree. It's called uh, nature. And so there's going to be a big emphasis coming up at the UN Biodiversity Conference in just a little, uh, a little while, uh, late April, early May, on uh, nature-based uh, solutions to the climate crisis, but of course to the extinction crisis. And as Selena will talk about, um, nature is also the key remedy to other ails of ailments of industrial civilization, uh, health problems, and <coughs> uh, saving nature is important for the economy. Uh, coastal temperate rainforest, of course, just like the inland rainforest. This is the inland rainforest, by the way. Um, <coughs> our, our, you know, tremendous carbon capture and sequestration devices. <laughs> Yeah, so natural climate solutions are factoring into the whole move to protect nature now. And now here's the biggie. Okay, so I, I've been working for 30 years plus to protect old growth forests in British Columbia. For the last um, several decades, there's been policy stagnation on um, changing up uh, the, the old growth liquidation conversion model of, of uh, managing old growth in British Columbia. When the NDP were elected in 2017, there was, we had a government that actually became pushable. So we um, developed a whole series of draft recommendations and we pushed hard through, and you may have remembered all the stuff around um, the uh, logging in the Nemint Valley and uh, you know, uh, Edinburgh Mountain. And we mobilized uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, online, uh, got as much news coverage as we could. And then, um, what happened is in the fall of 2019, under pressure, because the NDP are worried about their vote splitting to the Greens, essentially to uh, Sonia and Adam and to this, the, on, on the South Island, they implemented the Old Growth Strategic Review Panel to gain public input. That panel came up with actually 14 great recommendations um, in the spring of 2020. And under pressure, the NDP ended up adopting those um, recommendations during the provincial election in the fall of 20 and uh, fall of 2020. And so one of them was to have um, immediate moratoriums in the most at risk ecosystems because you can't have talk and log. While all of these recommendations are being implemented, you've got to actually retain the most important, most at risk forests. And so what they had is they had this um, Einstein looking scientist and her team, uh, uh, who Rachel Holt, Dr. Rachel Holt and her team come up with the, 
a um, assessment, an inventory of where the the grandest, the most, uh, the oldest, and the most endangered by ecosystem type old growth stands were across the province um, with the best available data. And so they came up with priority deferral areas totaling 2.6 million hectares of unprotected most at risk old growth in those categories. And if you zoom in, then you see these are scattered stands of the rare stands. This is in Clackwood Sound now, uh, scattered across the landscape recommended for deferral. Um, now, I wanna point something out, several things here. Um, this is a huge juncture from the past because even though I know I've been there, I've been, I'm, I'm there right now. Um, it's tough dealing with this issue and it's frustrating. Let's remember that it's the first time that the policy stagnation of doing the same thing has been ruptured. There, they've opened the BC government has opened the door for a major policy overhaul on old growth forestry if we keep pushing. Um, they've adopted the 14 recommendations, which are good ones. Now, for the first time, they flipped that whole scenario of logging the small trees and saving, oh, sorry, saving the small trees and logging the big trees. Now, because of uh, Rachel Holt, and this all happened under pressure, they are now, they've now <laughs> mapped out and accepted in principle um, the ways to save the biggest trees, uh, identifying the biggest trees and, um, and starting from there. Now, uh, so this is a big change. This is, this is a huge change. The, um, uh, now, when people see that, they think, well, a two-year deferral, we don't need just a deferral. We need permanent protection. The way it works here is that um, protection happens through First Nations land use planning. This is their unceded territories. And so in the end, First Nations ultimately decide on what gets protected or what doesn't happen. And the process um, is through land use planning, which takes many years. It's not just drawing a line around a map. <laughs> you, there, there's, a, there's a whole lot of different data layers, consultation with community members, with elders, with, um, uh, with uh, knowledge holders, um, discussions with different stakeholders in their territories. Uh, and um, essentially you eventually end up with something like in Clackwood Sound, which is more advanced, where the Ahousit came up with the, the Ahousit land use vision that puts 82% of their territories off limits to uh, industrial logging, to, to logging actually in general. Um, so that, so in other words, it's not just fragmented pieces. Those are the heart of the old growth, the best stands, but those eventually get encompassed if there's critical funding, which I'm gonna talk about um, in larger actual protected areas that include the forest in between other old growth, second growth that can recover into old growth. Um, and then that's where legislated permanent protection happens. But in the meantime, you do need those deferrals in the most at-risk old growth. So you don't lose those, the best pieces. Um, so uh, all across BC, these are the uh, unceded territories of First Nations in British Columbia. I'm not sure all the environmental movement really understands the significance of this. This isn't a movement that can just push the BC government and then the BC government just steps in there and saves this. These are First Nations lands, that's their territories. The, and not only is it just, you know, um, you know, an ethical perspective, this is the courts have ruled this through successive court rulings that any major legislated change in land use, including new protected areas, has got to have the consent, the support of First Nations. And so it's through First Nations land use planning and protected areas in the communities where that um, those decisions will ultimately be made. The provincial government needs to help create the critical framework, and most importantly, the funding to allow that to happen. Um, across the old growth zones in British Columbia, First Nations communities have an economic dependency on old growth timber um, in the form of revenue sharing agreements, but way beyond that, um, joint ventures with major companies, uh, employment agreements, and their actual logging tenures on a, on a major scale. 12% um, of the cut, um, a few years ago, it's probably more now, uh, are um, allocated uh, to First Nations. And that includes hundreds of millions of dollars annually in revenues in old growth logging going to First Nations communities. It's both an unrealistic and unreasonable approach to expect that First Nations just walk away from their main source of jobs and revenues because people from the outside told them they needed to save the old growth. They've got their own old growth champions We've got an important perspective to bring as conservationists, but ultimately 
we need to support First Nations old growth protection initiatives, and it's got to be made concrete through critical funding in order to enable um, a shift towards a sustainable economy away from old growth forestry, old growth logging. And that means a lot of money. Um, in the Great Bear Rainforest, the central and north coast, the way that uh, about 70% of those forests were made off limits to for logging was through the um, uh, through conservation financing. And so um, uh, conservation groups bringing in, in total, 60 million of their own, 60 million in government funding to finance uh, tourism, um, sustainable seafood, like scallop aquaculture. This is a, uh, what is that? <laughs> aromatherapy, um, uh, conifer needles, aromatherapy in the Great Bear. Um, so different products uh, that um, have been developed, um, potentially clean energy as well, uh, um, as a means to develop revenues and jobs so uh, communities can move away from um, old growth logging, uh, jobs and stewardship and management in Indigenous Guardians programs that are happening all over the place. Um, and as a result of that type of support um, in the Great Bear Rainforest, even though there are some loopholes, right, that have to be uh, have to be closed as a whole, it far exceeds any other protected areas uh, level of old growth protection anywhere else in the um, province, along with Clackwood Sound, which is because of key funding to support Indigenous old growth protection initiatives. That's what's got to happen across the rest of the province, as well as for some private lands like the Cameron Firebreak and other um, uh, old growth forests on private lands. There's got to be government funding to and conservation groups funding to um, buy those private lands. And there's got to be funding for workers transition and legal compensation as well for some of the licensees. Um, so to make it all happen, uh, oh, this is okay. This is another slideshow. This is too much detail here, but for the immediate deferrals, there needs to be 50 million plus. For First Nations capacity and business development linked to new protected areas, probably at least 800 million plus. This is a paradigm shift in the province. Looks like a lot, but for a ma massive paradigm shift, this is not much. Private land acquisition, probably about 100 million plus. Then you have significantly more through timber licensee compensation under the law and workers transition. Minimum is, is getting close to a billion. It'll ultimately be over a billion. That's the reality. If you wanna do a transformation of the current status quo across the province. The federal government, for all the people's criticisms of Trudeau, and I share a lot of them on different aspects, but on protected areas, he is putting his money where his mouth is. They've already made $2.3 billion to expand protected areas. Roughly about 300 million is allocated to BC for protected areas, 50 million specifically for old growth protection in BC. And they've said, we can do more. Um, but the BC government so far has been playing coy and not embracing that. They're like, oh, well, maybe, maybe we'll talk. It's because they know that that money coming in will transform what happens on the ground. And what they've been trying to do until, I think until very recently is constrain change. Um, and they didn't want the money that would drive power that change. They may be changing now, though. Um, there's also another bigger, another big fund, the Nature uh, Smart Climate Solutions that plays into it. That and they allocated about 200 million of that very recently um, across the country, but also to include conserving temperate forests. The federal commitments anywhere from roughly 200 to 400 million dollars potentially for protecting old growth in BC. That's real. That's that's uh, that's moving ahead. And now the BC government. Um, they were basically committing just about zilch until the provincial budget, because we pushed. That's where we focus. We got tens of thousands of, uh, of, of uh, messages in and uh, focused on the news media and work with First Nations partners to push. Now they're putting $185 million over three years. That's mixed in with workers' transition funding, probably compensation for contractors and licensees. The most important part, the First Nations component, probably about half of that. So that's maybe about a third of the 300 million that the province needs to contribute. Um, but it's getting there, better than zero dollars. Um, you know, about 90 to 100 million for First Nations is a big deal. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, we're still short by several hundred million. But we've set up a sister organization called the Nature Based Solutions Foundation to start raising um, funding. We've raised about a million dollars and that's why I'm here in BC right now to try to raise funding that will help fill those funding gaps uh, to support indigenous protected areas for sometimes small licensees like woodlot owners and sometimes um, private land acquisition, different gaps that have to be filled in order to um, have an old growth solution.
but we need the province to move forward. That's the big gap still in funding. And so what we have here, oh, okay. So now this is, uh, Celine is gonna talk about how we're a little bit different, quite different in, in some of the old approaches, which is mobilizing our own base. She'll talk about that. Let me stop my share. Okay. All right, thanks, Ken. Holy smokes, you gonna take a breath? <laughs> yeah, so so welcome again, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm Selena, as we mentioned before. I didn't get much of a, a bio. I wasn't able to send it into Stephanie in time. So I can tell you a little bit about me. I've worked in um, government before. I've worked in uh, nonprofits before. So I have this nice um, behind the scenes look into what helps drive change from the inside from my time with government. So I'm bringing that to this role, that kind of understanding from behind the scenes. So uh, I am super, super happy to, to be now working with Endangered Ecosystems Alliance and particularly on the parts that, that I have in my portfolio of work that I'm gonna talk about right now. So I'm just gonna queue up my slideshow here, just a sec. Now it might look just like Ken's, <laughs> but I have my own locally. All right, so hold on, let me just adjust the location of a couple of things. There we go, excellent. All right, so the, the Endangered Ecosystems Alliance, we have this, this unique emphasis that our organization brings to this environmental movement. We've got these these sort of non-traditional messages that we're pushing out. And we're also engaging with non-traditional allies. Let me explain. <laughs> so uh, often a conservation movement will involve things that are, are saying no, uh, no to old growth logging, uh, no to destructive practices, which is very important, don't get me wrong. Uh, but what we're wanting to do is to take it further, further than saying no because people can only hear an emphasis on the negative for so long, right? They, they want to know what you're in favor of eventually. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're emphasizing reasons to say yes to con conservation. We want to hear about these, these alternatives, um, these alternative messages from the negative messages, messages that are all about an emphasis on how does conservation impact the average person in their daily lives. So, so here are a few uh, activists. <laughs> Thanks, Ken, this is one of your uh, pieces of work here. So a little spotted owl at the legislature. <laughs> so environmental concerns, they, they unfortunately tend to recede into the background when, when there's a large crisis uh, in say health or in the economy. And this is often because environmentalism, the environment, it, it seems to focus on the other in a lot of people's minds. Probably, probably not the folks on, on this presentation, but, <laughs> but often for the general public, right? So it's like uh, extinction of other species, it's uh, climate threats that are, that are in the future for, for other generations, but, but it's not, environment's not so much about people's daily lives, unfortunately, fortunately. <laughs> so Ken has already talked about averting the extinction crisis. You, you touched a little bit, Ken, on the climate crisis. So what I'm bringing in is this, this non-traditional message that's about conservation, about protecting nature for health and for the economy. So these two, health and economy, they're very often the most powerful motivators for the general public. You do opinion polling and these top the, the, the main concerns of the general public, right? So environmentalism, it's never gonna become powerful enough for us to achieve its goals. Unless, unless we can show the positive impacts from conservation on these two most important factors in most people's lives. So environmentalism, it has to, it has to address the daily proximate concerns about folks general folks. So I'm going to talk about health first. Here's a fun list of all the positive effects of spending time out in the woods. I'm sure everyone on this call has experienced all of these. <laughs> and 
these are all these, these profound psychological positive effects that has been known to be called the, the old friend hypothesis. I'm sure some of you have heard about that. So, so we've co-evolved with nature, right? So this, this walk in the woods is like going for a walk with an old friend um, and, and having all those psychological benefits that come with it. Also, this is exciting. I'm sure many people on the call have heard this. Plants are producing this compound called phytoncides. And when we breathe those in, we're actually improving our immune system, which is really fun. One group that we're connecting with, one of the non-traditional allies I'll talk about later, called CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. These doctors, they're actually prescribing time in nature to their patients, which is awesome. <laughs> All right, so now that was health. Let's take a look at the economic benefits of protecting natural areas. So many, many studies have shown that protected areas actually have a net benefit on the economy, diversifying and making these economies more resilient and ultimately more prosperous. Let's take a look at uh, Port Renfrew, for example. So this is a case in point where a town went from primarily fishing and logging for their, for their economy and then shifted and diversified their economy for tourism and all the, the spin-off um, employment that comes with tourism. So those two categories, are, they're, they're not the only things that have, that have driven the economy in that community. It's also pushed up real estate values. Only just a couple of years ago, uh, Port Renfrew was rated the seventh best place in BC for real estate investment. All right, now, uh, moving back into an urban center or over to an urban center, those places are changing too. We're seeing skilled workers uh, moving into areas that are adjacent, close to protected areas for that outdoor lifestyle, for, for the, the mountain biking, for the hiking, for the kayaking, all that stuff. This is especially true in industries like high tech. This further diversifies those economies as these new skill sets start coming into those areas. Well, let's head back out into the woods. So intact forests are protecting waterways, clean habitat for fish, healthy fish populations, which in turn supports recreational and commercial fisheries. And then let's zoom way out to the societal level. There's a whole lot of benefits that are called ecosystem services, which I'm sure people are familiar with. So this benefits, of course, both the economy and the quality of life for everyone. An obvious example is forests that provide flood control, erosion control. We all, recent, uh, we all witnessed the, the recent floodings that happened across the province and those disruptions that were uh, seen and felt in the supply chain. These have obvious impacts on business. There are, of course, other ecosystem services I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, natural sewage treatment, uh, regional climate control, and others. All right, so those are all the non-traditional messages that we're getting out there about, about why it's great to be pro-conservation. But let's go beyond the choir, too, and start bringing in new folks. So um, we, want to, we want to expand the conservation movement beyond beyond the, the, the folks on, on this call, right? We need to, to broaden that tent, to bring more people in, bring more people into this conversation. Often, often we tend to mobilize folks that are a lot like us, right? A, a lot like us, we, we're committed to um, biodiversity protection. We're committed to sustainable, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, stabilizing the climate. Of course, our work is all vital, and I want it to go further. So we, we want to bring in these non-traditional allies because to get a campaign that's powerful enough to leverage key policies and government funding, that's all necessary to protect old growth and other endangered ecosystems. We need to broaden and scale up this environmental movement. We need to bring in non-traditional allies. So if we do that, what's gonna happen? Well. 
We're going to increase the, the movement's breadth, the scale. We're going to cut across party lines and bring people in with all the same values as we have for conservation. <laughs> and this is going to help transform the, uh, the society, transforms economies, economies, cultures, and all of this is then going to align with conservation. So we've been having uh, great success with businesses. Uh, the response from the business community has come in through this resolution that we've put forward. This resolution calls on, on, the, the, on governments to take meaningful action for conservation. And on our webpage, if you check it out, you can see this long list of companies that have signed this resolution. We've got tourism, of course, real estate, health and wellness, food, agriculture, high tech, communications, architecture, all kinds of firms, design firms all across the map that have signed our resolution uh, that will be put forth uh, to the government. In total, we have 137 businesses, uh, 126 of them are, are in BC. Beyond just signing the resolution, we are super happy to engage even more with these folks. So, so these three here, for example, they've all provided quotes for a recent press release we had um, about this. And we're extra happy to work with Johnny Rogers. He's the uh, founding employee of Slack. He's given super generously to us for conservation financing. And his generosity has actually kicked off a cascade of other businesses to do the same. I mentioned uh, unions a second ago about different groups that we want to connect with. So when we do, we're looking for, for common ground, right? And, and this is a great example here. This is Arnie Burkhoff. He's the former president of Pulp, Paper and Woodworkers um, of Canada Union. So our organizations, uh, AFA specifically, actually worked with him for decades, calling on the ending of raw log exports and for a value-added sustainable second forestry industry. Eventually his union joined us in the call to end old growth logging. <laughs> and we're engaging with diverse faith groups. Uh, here's a picture of a mosque, but of course all kinds of faith groups that we're gonna be bringing in. Across a bunch of faith groups, you can see this repeated, this, this belief that Caring for the earth is one of the greatest expressions for being responsible to creation. And of course, we continue to work with scientists that inform the direction that a lot of our work takes. So this is the famous Andy McKinnon. <laughs> the one on the left, not, not the tree in the middle. <laughs> and of course, most importantly, we're supporting First Nations and they're in their creation of new protected areas and their sustainable initiatives. So those are the, the two sort of non-traditional approaches that, that we're working on to, to bring in, to, to put out more messages about why conservation is for everyone. And then also to bring in these non-traditional allies to, to really scale up this movement. I'll give the, the, the reins back to Ken now. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to a share screen on mine. And oh, I was supposed to get ready my sorry. <laughs> um, did I? Uh, apologies for that. I was supposed to get this ready. I was watching Selena instead. Um, <laughs> I am very engaging, I have to say. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay. Is that shared yet? Not yet? Yeah, almost. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so I'm just gonna end off here. So um, here are a few of the uh, ancient forests that we need protection. Like this, this comes in the framework of a, the province needing to get on board at a minimum, the national protected areas targets and the whole international protected areas momentum, but also provide the critical funding to protect these old growth forests. We mentioned by this, uh, Selena mentioned by the way that these tech guys have come to support with almost a million. By the way, that's not for Endangered Ecosystems Alliance. That's through Nature-Based Solutions Foundation to help um, with conservation financing with Indigenous communities um, and or with land acquisition uh, and also to deal with uh, probably some of the small licensees, the woodlot owners for that where support is needed as well. So there's a, a, 
a big push, but we do need the province in particular to come on board. This is the Jurassic Grove. Um, uh, that is the uh, an old growth forest. If, if it gets protected, it'll become Jurassic Park uh, uh, near um, near the Juan de Fuca Trail area in Pechidet territory. Um, this is the oh you already saw that. That's the mossy uh, Mossim Grove. Mossim is mossy plus awesome in a contraction. <laughs> the Mossim Grove near uh, near uh, in the San Juan Valley near Port Renfrew in Pechidet territory as well. Amazing ancient forest there. Um, this is in Dididat territory. Uh, some of the amazing old growth forests just west of Lake Cowichan. It's a Douglas fir with hemlocks growing off the site. Um, and this is uh, some of the amazing ancient forests again in that whole region, just in Dididat territory west of Lake Cowichan. Um, here's Pacific Rim National Park Reserve. One reason we need conservation financing is for, for example, this scenario. Um, the Dididat First Nations are settling their treaty. They're getting close to treaty settlement. Part of the treaty settlement is there's a large chunk in the heart of Pacific Rim National Park that will be removed from the national park. Um, right now, because it's a national park reserve, uh, and this is the core of the uh, Dididat lands. So I get it why they want those lands back. Those are their unceded territories. Um, but if these are the greatest ancient forests as well that are, um, that are currently protected. The treaty from what we've seen so far doesn't have any uh, provisions to protect those lands except a, a buffer of a few uh, dozen meters on either side of the West Coast Trail. Uh, the Nidinat Triangle is actually where um, these, uh, the modern conservation battles for old growth forests began around 1969, 1970. Um, so conservation financing is critical to provide the option for First Nations um, to establish indigenous protected and conserved areas and to build an alternative economy instead of old growth logging, should they choose that. But in every case where First Nations have been provided the opportunity to build a much more diverse, um, resilient, and ultimately more prosperous economy with the key financing to liquidating the old growth, the Port Alberni model of economic development, which and Port Alberni a few years ago was listed as like the worst place in BC to live. It's getting better now, but when you liquidate the resource and you crash the employment, it doesn't benefit, it collapses the economy and also um, the, the, uh, the uh, it collapses the ecosystem and the economy. Um, that's the wrong model to go. So we need to provide the options, the province in particular and the federal government, um, and we're doing what we can. So uh, th that's one thing that flag is that we would like to see an indigenous protected and conserved area there, but um, that is ultimately up to the First Nations. But what we can do is facilitate that process if they so choose to protect those areas. Time is running out. Um, so we need to build a much broader, robust movement. Um, a huge movements in British Columbia, the Ferry Creek movement, uh, protests and blockades around the province, uh, MLA offices, massive online mobilization, expanding the movement to businesses, unions, faith groups. Um, we will get there. This is a province that um, where people really care about native ecosystems. If we, if we broaden this movement, then we will get the province and they're moving step by step um, under pressure uh, to overhaul the old, old growth policies to, to now um, designate the most at risk old growth um, the, uh, of the big trees uh, for deferral. They've implemented deferrals on 550,000 hectares in BC timber sales territories and hundreds of thousands of hectares in other areas. They haven't gone far enough yet. And the most important thing is funding to support indigenous led old growth protection initiatives. Um, so time is running out. This is the Namint Valley. This was the ninth widest Douglas fir that was known on record once we, we located this tree in 2018. And they still cut it down. The ninth widest Douglas fir, they still cut it down. Um, but things are changing. So we need all the help you can. Um, and this is the Klanawa Valley and, and did it that territory, Huayat territory sort of integrating on Southern Vancouver Island. Um, this is how I felt when I first, I felt like um, I was going to go into a great adventure when I was 17, involved in the old growth movement. That's how I'm starting to feel more and more after a few decades. Maybe this is how I'll look by the time we finally protect old growth and the endangered ecosystems. But there is hope. My little daughter gives me great joy and she's a little nature lover. And uh, it's, it's uh, for the ecosystems and also for my little daughter, Lou. <laughs> I'm determined to see this through and work with everybody and I'm grateful for the Victoria Natural History Society, 
he, one of the greatest um, you know, conservation groups on Vancouver Island has always been there. Every time we've gotten a new project going, Victoria Natural History Society members have been sort of the foundation of it all. So that's our new organization, pretty new organization, three years old. Um, we're still poor ourselves, by the way. We need to hire more staff. There's only three of us. Um, so anything you can do to help us so we can pick up a new campaigner, an assistant, um, and a fundraiser so we don't have to do fundraising ourselves to free, liberate us so we can campaign. That would be a great thing. Thank you very much for your time and, and the amazing work of Victoria Natural History Society. I stand corrected, by the way. I said I heard there's only 50 badgers. Apparently, there's a couple hundred of them still in BC. <laughs> so that's a good thing. So, uh, oh, sorry, you got to do the stop share. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Ken and Selena. That was fantastic. Um, I, I wanted to, um, it doesn't look like there's been any questions throughout in the chat, but I'm sure people have lots of questions and comments. So feel free to um, unmute and, uh, and ask your questions or raise your hand. Um, lots of thank yous coming in and people really appreciating your talks and awesome presentation yeah we learned a lot about what's happening in bc and across the country and i love your model i think it really resonates and it's a uh, very much needed in these very stressful and negative times people are, i think are certainly appreciating the value of nature in new ways people that hadn't in the past so um but um does anyone have any questions that they want to raise for Ken or Selena? There's a comment here, Friends of Ecological Reserves would be a natural partner for you in BC. Yeah, if, if anyone on the call, I'm gonna write that one down, but if anyone on the call owns a business or, or is close to someone who does own a business, please get in touch because we can add more people to that resolution to sign and it, it might seem like a small little thing but but it's going to snowball into something fantastic same as um nonprofits too right we've had dozens of nonprofits sign the resolution there's a resolution calling on the province to fund old growth and expand protect areas on our website so that's in the total signatory is about 170 now if you include the nonprofits too that's right yeah if you put everyone in yeah. Has the VNHS signed the sign? The um, I don't, I don't think, think so. Have yet. No. Okay. I'll put the I'll put the link in the chat right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me go find it. And there's another comment about uh, ecological reserves. There are several candidate ecological reserves in old growth forests on the Sunshine Coast. Oh, very nice. I know there's an amazing one by Homesite Creek area. I think somewhere around there is. I saw one with um, little caves too, <laughs> some karst areas. Uh, and... <laughs> there we go. Oh, there's the link for anyone who. Who is the leader of an organization, nonprofit, or or company, or faith group, even union? Put me in touch with them, and I'll go go after them. Yes, and thank you for that one, Jenny. So um, I'll just ask a question. Um, so what what's your um, where are you going next? What's your top priority right now in terms of places outside of the old growth forest in BC? Um, well, there's a, yeah, old growth, of course, is consuming the majority of our time because we are only three of us right now. But we, um, um, yeah, we spend a lot of time in the Carolinian zone in Southern Ontario uh, and also on the prairies in the last uh, year and a half. So on some of the First Nations reserves, for example, they have established indigenous protected and conserved areas in spectacular, diverse, deciduous forests. Some of the biggest tracts, they ask for funding in order to, because there's also housing needs and pressures on the land there, right? So, um, but the, uh, they were turned down by the federal government at the time because the federal government believed that there weren't enough hectares. You're never going to get a lot of hectares in the, the Carolinian zone. These are just so species rich. It's like the subtropics of Canada, you know, in a, a little bit of hyperbole there, but like spectacular um, uh, diversity, the most diverse places in the country. 
And that's why an ecosystem, ecosystem based targets are vital so that, you know, the federal government and the provinces don't just try to get hectares to meet their targets, but they actually save the all types of ecosystems. Um, so we want to uh, help to protect Carolinian ecosystems in the next while and on the prairie grasslands too. Um, we'll probably end up having to work with ranchers and also several First Nations um, to protect those areas. The, the, there's no way to save grasslands without um, engaging and working with ranchers in some of these key areas. The ranchers did fight and kill those, those um, largely it was the ranchers who killed the, the uh, coal mining uh, proposals in the Rockies. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, well, if that's that's all, I'm happy to get going here, but I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity, as always. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. And uh, best of luck with everything. We will follow uh, your progress and love to support your work. And thanks okay. for the really engaging and interesting presentation and hopeful as well. Uh, yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. I love Victoria Natural History Study. <laughs> Take care, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.